Hi. I've already kind of stuck the oar in from the back, and now my turn is to do it from the front. Um, that's me. Uh, well, that's the session. Uh, I think we've got something like 30, maybe 40 minutes um, to talk around new standards, existing and new emerging standards in the cybersecurity arena. Uh, introduction to me, um, yeah, that's a bit scary. I should have used the one you had on your rolling slides beforehand where it was all blotted out, the faces, <laughs> but one of them was. Oh, one. It would have been far better than this. <laughs> so me, I'm um, Executive Director of IT Governance. I'll tell you a bit about our company in a minute because our marketing team will shoot me if I don't. So we'll get that out of the way and then we'll do the session proper. Um, I do a number of things. I'm Chair of the User Group for 27001. That's the Information Security Management Systems Requirement Standard. I'm guessing a fair number of you are familiar with that, roughly. Show of hands, please. Yeah, well, pretty much all of us. Cool. Um, I chair the National Standards Committee in the UK for the development of information security and security technology related standards. So that's the National Standards Body part of BSI Group. I chair that committee. Uh, I'm a member of the international committee that the UK committee mirrors. Is it getting confusing yet? Because it confuses me. <laughs> not for you at the back. Malcolm, wasn't it? <laughs> it's getting not confusing. Um, I've authored some books, apparently, and so we put a link in there. And I'm also uh, contracted to UCAS, who accredit the certification bodies, and I do those assessments for the ISMS and ITSMS schemes. Not the only one, there's a few of us that carry the burden. It's probably not the right way of describing it, is it? But, you know, we'll go with that for now, carry the burden. So, yeah, um, that, that all looks very impressive. It doesn't mean I, I certainly don't know it all. There's far too much to know. What it does mean is uh, I'm liable to wander off from what I'm meant to be saying tonight and cover a whole raft of different topics. Uh, but I do have some slides to try and keep me on track. And please remind me if I'm going too far off at any stage. Uh, a lot of the slides are quite wordy and you're all getting a copy anyway, so you can read them. So it doesn't really matter if I don't cover the material. I'll just join the number of things together as we go, uh, if that's all right with you. It also means I've got a pretty good network. So when I can't answer a question, um, I should be able to come back to you at some stage in the next few days with an answer that is valid. Uh, and I'll we'll certainly flag up when I don't know the answer, because there's bound to be a few. Uh, right, so what do we do at IT Governance? Well, we're, um, we set ourselves up as a one-stop shop for anything in the governance, risk management and compliance arena, which was a, a big aim. Uh, we started with information security, so Alan Calder and I, Alan Calder's our chief exec, uh, Alan and I understand or like to think we've got a rough idea about information security management systems, and that's what we focused on initially. We offer things like consultancy training. We've got a small imprint, uh, so we publish books and that sort of thing. Um, and sell some software occasionally. Not a key area of ours right, right now, but it's a growing area. Those are some of the disciplines um, and related disciplines around the cybersecurity arena. So that's the marketing bit out of the way. So I can kill that and ask, uh, I'm meant to be talking about cybersecurity standards. What's your understanding of cybersecurity? Can anyone give me a description of what is cybersecurity? Well, something that's going on with Facebook at the moment. Okay. A protection of data, personal data. So personal data aspects, well, it could definitely. Be any, it yeah, could sure. Be any data, it sure. Could be corporate data, but anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, yes. Defending yourself from people who have got a malicious intent to, to get your. Uh, get your information and use it. Yep. Cyber security. They, they, they're two great examples or relevant examples uh, directly uh, concerned with privacy issues, typically, aren't they? But huge organisations, they have equal concerns for their own well-being, don't they? Well, you could say people sending bugs into the internet. So it, that's another aspect of it, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. The, the, the emerging standards, there's no common definition of cybersecurity, and that's kind of why I'm asking, because um, it's kind of the buzz phrase right now, but there's, there's no consistent definition of cybersecurity. 
it's emerging and there are fresh cybersecurity standards being created at an international level that might see the light, well, one of them has been published, but the others might see the light of day in the next, who knows, 12, 18 months. Um, but the, the other the, aspect is um, on a national scale or a regional scale, with infra connected to infrastructure. So yeah. there's a lot of uh, national infrastructure that depends on networking, connectivity, uh, and there's been many examples of actual or alleged attacks on infrastructure complexes like power stations to sure. disrupt them, rail networks, yep. traffic light schemes, and the like. Totally. So there, there's there's a number of stabs at defining uh, cyber security, and in, in my mind, it, it's pretty much anything is protecting anything that is or could be threatened by some form of connectivity. So Internet of Things, there's a direct cyber security relationship to Internet of Things. Um, any system that's protected by or could be jeopardized by something connected to the Internet is not a bad starting point from an understanding angle. How that relates to information security, some of my colleagues on some of the committees um, say that cyber security is a much bigger concern. Others say that it's a subset of information security. Um, to be honest, I've not got a strong view one way or the other. I just think they're both things that are very closely related and we should actually be managing them proactively. But that will come out through the rest of the slides if I ever get back to them. So I probably should. Um, right, so <laughs> um, this is what I'm gonna hopefully be talking about. How can cybersecurity standards that are out there right now and emerging, how can they help organisations address these concerns, including privacy, of course, um, and other issues? Some of the new cybersecurity standards that have come out relatively recently that you may or may not be aware of, subject to how closely you work with 27001, I guess, or follow um, BSI on social media. That's the standards body. I'm not promoting them in any other guys. So... BS 7799 Part 3, anyone heard of that? No, he's, he's, he's mm, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll come back to that in a few slides <laughs> time. It's the British Standard for Information Security Risk Management. Hmm. I'll come back to it. Um, BS, how do you say that? Is that BS 311111? I, I, I lose count. BS, uh, the launch event a couple of weeks ago, someone described it as BS 31 treble 1. And I kind of, I, I can kind of get my head around that. But anyway, BS3, whatever that is. That's, um, I'm, I'm going to be focusing more on that in the slides today. It's uh, guidance for the board and the governing body on cyber risk and resilience. That just trips off a tongue, doesn't it? I don't know. Um, this is an ISO international standard that basically talks about how other standards can be used for managing cyber security. So either 27,001 and 27,017 and dot, dot, dot. And I'll, I'll mention some of these standards again as we go through today. And my key objective is to explain how some of these, the patchwork or network of these standards could be maybe uh, combined and used to help you or any organisation manage its cyber security issues and concerns and commitments. As we know from context, and I'm sure I don't need to tell you in the room, as we know from context, it, uh, we as an organisation should be concerned with the requirements of interested parties. Interested parties can include those that feel they're affected by the operations of the organisation. And so it, it's indeed those commitments to the public, to clients and the like. Um, because we are, what day are we on? The 11th of April. So we're about uh, five, six weeks away from um, GDPR, the uh, date where some people say it's a drop, uh, go live date or whatever they want to call it. It's actually when it sort of comes into uh, real effect, not that they're going to start, the ICO said it's not going to start levying massive fines immediately, thankfully. But there's a couple of other standards that are related. BS 10,012. It's a specification for PIMS, unfortunately a personal information management system, but hey, uh, I prefer other options. And 
not yet published, but as a committee draft, and next week there is a meeting of SC27 in Wuhan, in China, where hopefully it will get voted for this standard to go from a committee draft to a, what's the next one? Um, FDIS. FDIS, maybe, or DIS, maybe. No, this. I should know that. <laughs> Um, so that's uh, basically the international version of the PIMP standard. It's not actually the international version of BS 10,012, but it kind of does the same thing. And it's closely related to 27,001 as a model, if you're familiar with that standard. Anyway, um, some of the things we're going to be touching on to various degrees as we go through the next probably hour, half an hour, 35 minutes or so. Um, <coughs> One of the big challenges, of course, is that there are almost too many standards. Information and cyber security related standards, that is. They've uh, given the, the impact of connectivity, the internet, cyber security, that the standards have all evolved almost too quickly. Um, and hence, we've got this whole raft or spread of massive uh, options as to what we might want to deploy, utilise, or engage with. So here we've got some, um, for years there's been information security standards uh, around check printing, to make sure the checks are valid, uh, um, integrity is protected, that they're not going to be compromised. Uh, public sector standards, um, payment card industry, anyone who's got one of them little bits of plastic with the 16 digits across the middle, there's a whole raft of security measures around that, typically imposed through contract. Um, the ISF has had a good practice guide for some time. Anyone, how many of you have heard of Cyber Essentials? Yeah, so it's, a, it's the government's entry level uh, badge, if you want, for organisations to demonstrate that they're doing the, dare I say, bare minimum of cyber security to address pretty basic internet born attacks. I'll talk about that in a little bit more. There's been some sector-specific schemes for quite some time, slightly out of date using the CESG, maybe, logo, but certainly for telecoms there's been a, a standard there, there for a, a number of years. And there's new emerging standards, uh, BS3, sorry, I'm stood in your way there, right? BS3, uh, whatever we decided we were going to call it, 31, track yeah. 1. Thanks. Because oh, um, it's annoying me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and organisations, of course, create their own controls. They have their own security control bible of one guise or another. Without looking at any of these frameworks, any organisation, its security stance will evolve through, um, typically through feeling the pain and then reacting as a result. Talking to just a few of these standards in a little bit more detail, as I say, some of the slides are really wordy, but you're getting a copy so you can reference, refer back to them when you want. Um, Cyber Essential Scheme launched in, I think it was actually launched in June, formally announced in April, some of the documents were published, launched in June 2014, I believe. Uh, adoption hasn't been quite as um, quick as people would have liked. Um, there's talk of cyber essentials being revisited. Got a question? Or okay. Um, and it's the first step on the cyber security ladder, really, or information security uh, ladder, to say we, we've covered the basics. Government went out and did a consultation to look at all the existing standards to find out which one met their requirements. Decided none of them did, so they created another one. Didn't I just say there were too many standards out there? Anyway, never mind. Um, so, there's five high-level requirements for cyber essentials, and there's kind of um, an introduction to it there. PCI DSS, really briefly, uh, is a contractual obligation for organisations using, taking any form of, or processing any form of payment card within their network or operations. The... Um, it's quite a specific standard with regards to setting levels of attainment on specific controls and arrangements. It's, uh, it applies to only aspects of an organisation's activities, those where the cardholder data is processed. 
So it typically doesn't apply to an entire organisation, whereas Cyber Essentials is more likely to be applied to a whole organisation. Each of these standards providing a degree of assurance around the information security arrangements that the organisation, or cyber security arrangements that the organisation's um, exercising. Information security um, covers the protection or uh, yeah, protection of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So it's not just keeping things locked up, it's making sure they're available when they're required and when they are accessed, that the information uh, and systems are providing everything they should be. So the, the information is complete and accurate, the systems have got sufficient bandwidth um, and don't leak data where they shouldn't be. So realistically, any organisation looking at information security from a coordinated manner should be considering using a blend of controls from different sources to build its defences. Not necessarily this combination, obviously, but selecting controls from a whole raft of different sources to suit their issues, their sector, their geographies, um, in fact, pretty much their context is a term that we've all become massively familiar with since uh, Annex SL has been rolled out across various management system standards. So to talk about a couple of the standards I've mentioned already in a little bit more detail, 27001, 2013, uh, the Information Security Management System Requirements Standard was first published in 2005. Um, the 2013 re revision, I kind of see that as uh, the ISMS specification or requirements kind of growing up a bit, it kind of matured. The 2005 version of the standard was very prescriptive around risk management. Um, many have called it onerous, uh, insisting on an asset-based risk management uh, approach and information security risk assessment. Um, some organisations used scope statements that were pretty meaningless. Uh, it mandated that you had to refer to a control set that was defined in Annex A of the standard. The 2013 version, um, the, the slightly more mature version if you want, allows the organisation to select controls from wherever they want and then compare them to a candidate list to make sure they haven't inappropriately omitted any. So there's that sense check against yes, a set of a list, a register of controls that they can select the controls from any source. The risk methodology is a lot more flexible, so it's not just asset-based, you can use in the event-based um, approach to information security risk assessment. And scoping is informed by what we're probably familiar with, the people in the room with, the contextual requirements around Annex SL, or driven by the higher level structure and core text in Annex SL, that derives or informs the definition of a scope. And that scope statement should be meaningful specifically or particularly if you're going down the accredited certification route. Certification bodies have got a, an obligation under some other standards within the Information Security Management System accredited certification scheme to ensure that scope statements are unambiguous, have clear boundaries, not misleading, etc., etc. So it's kind of grown up 27001, 2013. Now, if you're familiar with the 27,000 series, you might be aware of 27,005. 27,005 as a standard is an information security risk management standard. It's an international standard, hence you've got the ISO on it. ISO 27,005. But in the UK, we've got BS 7799 Part 3. Hmm. So, International standards can, but do not necessarily have to be adopted as a national standard. There's, a, there's a, an exception to that, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, in the UK, our national standards body had adopted ISO 27005. But that was published prior to this standard being available. When this standard was published, the guidance in 27,005 was no longer aligned to the risk management requirements in ISO 27001. So in the UK, British 
Scottish Standards Institution decided, actually, we'll come away from the international standard, we'll publish our own national standard that will reflect the requirements of 27001 2013. And hence, a, a committee, a small committee, we produced 7799 Part 3 tw 2017, which is our national standard until such time as, I imagine, until such time as the international arena publishes an ISO that aligns to and meets the requirements of 27001, or reflects the requirements of 27001. So that's those two. Um, since we're talking about cyber risk resilience and uh, standards management, uh, I thought I'd better bring up these two. There's a standard on governance of information security in the 27,000 series. There's a whole raft of standards in the 27,000 series to do with information security, uh, closely related to cyber security. And BS, this uh, one I can't say. Did I actually read, has anyone got a consensus or a view on how you say that? Not yet. Yeah. You just know it's that number, don't you? <laughs> uh, 31 treble 1 is what I'm going with. There, there's the um, really uh, catchy title, which doesn't help you, does it? Because you're not going to refer to that instead of that. But never mind. <laughs> as a very quick aside, I, I said, uh, as I said when my slide up introducing Lee uh, was there, I tend to go off on a couple of tangents. This one was planned. So... Um, in the UK, the adoption of ISO 27001-2013, BSI has published this document, BSEN ISO IEC 27001-2017. This is in severe danger of confusing all of us, and we kind of work with standards. Think about what it does for people who aren't as familiar with standards as we might be. That is actually the same document as this. It's exactly the same document. It's a more recent national adoption of the same international standard. Great, so how's that work? Well, 27001, there was two corrigenda issued, so technical corrections. It can't change your requirements, it wouldn't be a corrigenda, otherwise it's technical correction of a misunderstanding or an ambiguity in the text of the standard. So there's been two of those issued for 27001. BSI chose to publish them as separate doc uh, documents that basically you bolt on. They've incorporated those, but the thing that really drove this was its um, vote into an EN status. So that means any countries that are members of uh, SEN-SANELEC have to adopt that international standard as their national standard. So what I was just saying about BS 7799 Part 3 being a UK or a British standard coming away from ISO 27005 as the international standard for information security risk management. If 27005 were to be voted to receive EN status, BSI would have to withdraw BS 7799 Part 3 and adopt 27005 as the national standard for information security risk management. Following me? No, neither is anyone else. And that's part of the nightmare, isn't it? And I'm only sticking with BS's and ISO's and really, hmm, hey, never mind. That's the aside. Good news is we get back on the page. Um, <laughs> three, uh, yeah, that standard. What was it? Cyber risk resilience guidance management, something like that. Uh, why do we need another standard filling this uh, perceived space? Well. That's a jolly good question. That, that's what the standard claims to do. And when the committee that developed BS 31 treble 1, I think I decided it was called, uh, when the committee that developed that first started the development activity as a new work item proposal, the um, two of us prepared this paper saying, these are most of the related standards around this topic. And is there a space? Is there a need for this right now? The perception was that, yes, there is a need for it. Realistically, whether the published standard filled the perceived gap as to all of the standards that were out there is, uh, in my personal opinion, slightly debatable. I think it's made a relatively good job of what was uh, intended rather than, personally, rather than seeing it as guidance for 
the board, I would suggest it's probably guidance for those working to the board to help them understand cybersecurity, risk and resilience. And if you actually look at the size of the document, no board member's going to read through it um, and start trying to follow it. What they do is they'd say, hey, great, yeah, agree. Executive summary, great, who's doing that? Which member of the executive's gonna delegate that to their head or for their, um, sadly, probably head of IT, which it's not just IT, is it? Cybersecurity, human behaviors comes massively into play. And not that I'm suggesting you assign all cybersecurity issues to HR. Uh, <laughs> there's processes, there's facility management, there's a whole raft of things. Just going back to um, recent news items, did anyone see the piece in the press recently where I've got to look the MP's name up, otherwise I'm going to get it wrong. Uh, Kemi Badenoch, she um, admitted to hacking Harriet Harman's website, website yeah. Yeah. and changing some of the content. How did she hack the he website? Was it through using some clever bit of technology she downloaded? No, she guessed passwords. Just guess, guess passwords, 10 years ago. 10 years ago, wasn't Harriet Harman something like the uh, Shadow Attorney General or something like that? I think she was, wasn't she? Yeah, no problems there then. Good. Uh, anyway, um, guidance for top management. Talking of which, let's have a look at uh, top management. And uh, bear with me, because there's no chance of me reading that on that screen. So I'm gonna stand over here just for a minute whilst we have a look at this one. Because this is a slide of, uh, we've not seen before and I don't know what our marketing team have done. <laughs> so the seven, that, that's deliberate, it's kind of a seven sins, the C-suite, they think they're funny, bear with us. Uh, so there's seven of these coming up and you can um, determine whether these, it's a bit too Americanized or whether these roles actually exist or not. Very tongue in cheek, um, but as soon as you appoint as Chief Information Security Officer, uh, dare I suggest when I first got involved in quality management systems a fair few years ago, there, there was some organisations I joined where as soon as you had a quality manager, everyone else thought we don't need to worry about quality, we've got a manager for that. Uh, we've got a health and safety manager, great! Uh, and you know, you cover enough of them, no one's got to do anything. You've got a manager for that, it doesn't matter, you've just got to know who to point at. Yeah, great, that's, that's the problem with a CISO. Because you've got Chief Information Security Officer. <coughs> if it goes wrong, he's the one who gets, he or she, looks like a he in this case, is the one who gets kicked. Great, so that's a problem. Um, who we got next? Chief Audit, that doesn't work. Do you? Chief Audit Officer, the contrast I mean. <laughs> Chief Audit <laughs> Officer or Chief Compliance Officer. Hmm. I've worked in organizations where there's head of compliance and that sort of thing. Um, and they tend to have a specific discipline, and it's not cyber. And when they go to do an audit of cyber, they think, oh, that's IT security, so we'll get a technical expert in to help us, and that'll be an IT security expert. That's not cyber. And so I think that's a really uh, valid question. Do they have the competencies? And then, if they do find issues, have they got the mechanisms to be able to drive some sort of change going forwards. So right identifying the pitfalls and the issues, it's reacting to it. That's one of the key things that comes out in BS 7799 part three, which wasn't in ISO 27005. So British Standard and Information Security Management Systems, it's got whole rafts of guidance on how you can get an effective information security risk assessment. But just before we did the final, final draft of text, we went through it. And, and a colleague on the committee, a guy called David Brewer, um, he, he made the point and we decided, yeah, we'll do it throughout. We put in a really valid point saying, don't get too caught up in a risk assessment because it could go on too long. You don't derive benefit until you actually start reacting to it and doing something about it. So the risk treatment, yeah, sure, make the decision. Risk treatment is actually doing something about the risks you've identified is critical. Same sort of issue can say, can apply here. Who else we got? Um, Chief Technology Officer. Ah, they'll spend the IT budget, but they won't talk to the risk team, will they? Hmm, good. Maybe not so. 
there's going to be a finite budget for anything to do with information security, cyber security. Typically, it's not identified specifically for cyber or information security. It's part of a wider budget. But if they've spent it, you can't then invest it in cyber security. So you've got to think about the optimum blend and solution going forwards. Uh, Chief Information Officer translates business needs into IT services and vice versa. Right, okay. If they don't fully understand and embrace cyber risk, it's not going to end well. I think that might be one of the made up ones to make seven, don't you? Seven deadly sins, no? Maybe. Chief Risk Officer. Um, that's kind of repeating the point I just made, isn't it? Too many risk regimes, loads of stuff about risk assessment. You could have the most established, comprehensive risk assessment model going, but it's absolutely, absolutely useless if it stops there. It's got to follow through with actually doing something about it. But they'll be the ones saying, I told you so afterwards. I told you it was going to go terribly wrong. They didn't do anything about it, right? Good. Who else we got? Um, Chief Privacy Officer. Privacy, that's the hot topic, isn't it? GDPR, they'll get all the budget, won't they? Because everyone wants to avoid the fines of, what is it, up to 4% at the highest level? 4% of the global turnover or 20 million euros, whichever's the higher. Ouch. I mean, that's quite a hike from where it has been in the UK at half a million pounds. Um, and that's in the UK. If you were operating in, say, Ireland, the current level of fine, up to GDPR coming into play, was much lower than that. You couldn't get anywhere near the equivalent of half a million pounds. Um, so, I don't know if you've spotted, but people who work in privacy uh, are in massive demand right now. We employ some. And the salary demands of those we're trying to recruit just seem to be going through the roof. And if we're experiencing that, other organisations are experiencing that. And when you're trying to attract these people, they all stay for a little while, and then actually they found someone else who's going to pay another buck, a bit more. And so they don't stick around for long. They'll jump around. Hmm. And that's kind of what that's getting at. And what's our last one? Because uh, I'm assuming there's another one, because there's seven. Right, who we got? Oh, CFO. Cyber insurance. Anyone got cyber insurance? for their organisation. Apparently it's a growing trend. Um, it's, it's not clear when it's going to pay out. Hmm. There's, uh, isn't there, and this is where I'm going beyond my competence, <laughs> isn't there something about the Insurance Act saying that uh, if you want to benefit from insurance you have to declare all known issues and you have to manage them effectively or something to that effect? How are you going to demonstrate that? Because if you're not demonstrating that around cyber risk and resilience, you're not going to be able to make a claim anyway. Don't know. Anyway, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, and as I've said, that's probably beyond my level of competence anyway. Right, so, uh, yeah, good. What was number one again, please? CISO. CISO. Chief Information Security Officer. Oh, okay. The blame hound for when it goes wrong. We could have had a Chief Cyber Security Officer as well, couldn't we? But eight doesn't sound quite so good. But anyway, so um, that slightly tongue-in-cheek look at uh, the C-suite is meant to help realise that actually they've all got to be joined up and work together with regards to cyber risk issues and resilience. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so back onto the theme, really. BS31 Treble 1 talks about this concept of a cyber temple, or at least it uses the uh, graphic of a, a temple, a cyber temple, to represent how all its aspects are meant to support and work together. And that's massively important. It's a bit like what I'm sure you're all familiar with as management systems. You can go through, let's face it, a management system specification and answer each individual clause or subclause and put a means of demonstrating compliance, or conformity even, to get it correct, conformity with each of those requirements individually and have a totally ineffective management system because you've identified and addressed them as individual elements. Actually, it's how the management system works together that gives you the assurance and the effective um, 
solution you're looking for to deliver objectives. It's the same with cyber risk and resilience. You could address a whole raft of individual requirements or look at them as a, uh, a set of related requirements that give you the assurances you're then looking for as an organisation. Um, just a word of warning, if you Google Cyber Temple, you won't get anything about cyber risk and resilience. It's uh, it, 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 the Cyber Temple URL gives you something about meditation and uh, that sort of activity. That's not BS3 one, travel one, whatever we're calling it. But I guarantee you're all going to look at that rather than three, the three one, travel one, won't you? <laughs> but never mind. Anyway, um, so taking some of these elements in turn, and this is where I'm, I'm going to go through these relatively quickly. The slides are quite text heavy, and there is a um, one of the very last slides, there's a link where you can download a green paper with some questions related to a fair number of these things. So, um, benefits and outcomes. This is really where it's trying to uh, sell itself as a standard, I guess. <laughs> I think you should adopt this. Uh, it recognises, and this is one of the key issues that most don't um, really grasp, is it recognises that there's cyber good and there's cyber bad, but it's the same cyber. By which I mean, um, why, why do people open themselves up to all these risks, all these downsides, all these incidents, breaches, potential nightmares by being dragged through the press and reputational damage? It's because unless you embrace the cyber solutions that are available, the organisation isn't going to be around too long. The efficiencies that it delivers, the customer interface, it, it, Proffers, the whole solution of cyber is so powerful that unless you embrace it, the organisations um, yeah, got a short lifespan, I'd suggest. The problem is, of course, organisations grasp it and adopt it without actually thinking about where is it opening up potential holes that could then be uh, exploited by the bad guys and girls, or where there could be accidental or malicious activity internally that could cause problems for us going forwards anyway. So this is where it, talk, it starts to recognise the positive sides of cyber risk and the negative and say balance the two. It also talks about the uh, what sets cyber risks and resilience separate from general enterprise risk management activities and it reflects on how the cyber arena is so fast changing. And yes, sure, of course, any discipline, risks and risk assessments change over time. But in cyber, it is phenomenally fast. And the scale of a risk, if a, a new vector comes out or a new threat actor of some description um, is discovered, it, it can spread to such an extent that it's crazy, absolutely crazy. So being agile, fleet of foot in how you um, make sure that you're suitably informed and then react to that information that you receive as an organisation, that intelligence uh, is really played up in, in the standard. So we've got this at the top level there and as we move through the, uh, the temple, <coughs> uh, it talks about governance and assurance, good, as you'd expect. You, you can see that there's going to be some parallels here with what we recognise as a management system specification and time and time again going back to that piece of work I described right at the outset of working up BS31 Travel 1 was where's the space for this? Is there a, a hole this standard needs to fill? Hmm. Um, so yeah, it starts getting mightily close to uh, management system specification. The six pillars, I've only got a few on there because I wanted some of the slides to write some text on. Um, the six pillars, risk management, collaboration internally and externally. So uh, for some time there's been practices in information and cyber security um, communities where otherwise competitors would join forces. Banks have been doing it for years. Uh, there's a community of bank information security, of CISOs basically, who have worked out that if someone's attacking one bank from an information security angle, they're going to be attacking all of them. And so they get together and share knowledge and insights and intelligence that they're getting from their operations with each other to protect the industry. 
there's something called WARPS, uh, and I'm not going to recall what WARP stands for, but it, it, it facilitates that sort of discussion you know, across groups, whether it's regional bases, discipline, sector, etc. But sharing that intelligence, uh, knowledge, insight, feedback on what works, what isn't working, and, and importantly, identified weaknesses um, is massively important. And making sure that all change activities are considering cyber risk, as well as all the other issues around, I guess, privacy impacts assessments, um, health and safety risks, I'm sure you have to do, not that I'm at 45,001, that's the standard, isn't it? I do read stuff other than just cyber. Uh, all of those things are integrated into the business transformation challenge. Right, that's part one, part two, the other, the other three, if you want, adaptability, that's being able to, agility and being able to change quickly to this environment we're operating in. It's easy to get left behind, but at the same time, it's easy that as you're trying to keep up with the developments that competitors are making, that you can open yourself up to new risks and issues as well. Working out when to react to the intelligence you're getting. Fake intelligence. Maybe that's a phrase I should start trying to do something with. <laughs> Instead of fake news. No, anyway, remember, fake intelligence. I'll, I'll know a few of them. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, response. So when it does go wrong, knowing how you're going to react and respond, putting the measures in place that you can actually um, recover is an interesting prospect, I guess. Do you want to recover to where you were or recover to a steady state that enables you to operate going forwards? Maybe even in an improved state. It depends on what the incident is in the first place, of course. Um, I've made the point that all these have to act together. And then the foundations, if you want, well, that's what I'm going to call them. Uh, oh, yeah, look, it's on the slide. That's handy. Um, culture, encourage uh, things such as encouraging reporting if someone does something wrong. In, not quite rewarding them, but n certainly not admonishing them for saying, hey, look, I've screwed up, I've done something wrong. Um, we, uh, we provide a phishing service as in PH phishing, you know, emails that's trying to elicit you to do something you shouldn't be doing, not going out and casting bait. And so um, we do a phishing service, and when we work with our clients to, to run this phishing service, it's interesting to see those clients where, yes, a percentage of people will click on the dodgy link. It, it always happens. It always happens. And any organisation that says it doesn't, they've not done an effective test. It always happens. But it's interesting when it does happen, whether that organisation, any of the people who have clicked on the dodgy link, then immediately realise they've screwed up. That's a technical term in cyber security, screwed up. They've screwed up and then phone the help desk to say, look, I've clicked on something. Because if they do, it's starting to indicate that actually they've got an informed staff and someone has just not thought at that moment. But at least they're reporting it. That's good. You've got to recognise that as a, a good development, as opposed to those where you get a load of people click on it and then deny it ever happened. No, it doesn't matter. We'll just let people harvest data forever. Um, yeah, so there you go. That, that, that's You can read that for yourself. I don't need to read that out to you, do I? Uh, what else we got? Some of the details, some of the specifics from standards. Um, you can see... Uh, there, there's all sorts of drivers coming up. GDPR, I couldn't not mention it. It needs to be, you know, put the actual acronym on there. There's other um, regulations coming out at the same time. NIST directive, it's got exactly the same penalties as GDPR, just hasn't had the same sort of coverage um, in the press. It doesn't have the same spread across all organisations, but it's still going to hurt for organisations where it does apply and they don't react. Steve, NIS is... I knew you was going to ask that. I knew so. And it's... Um, Nash, go on, you're, you're Googling it's it for me. Can do Google. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I should know this. Uh, network, network and Information Systems. Brilliant. Network and Information Systems Directive. It differentiates between uh, um, huge players and not so huge players in the arena it applies to and um, sets out expectations as to what they're meant to do to play their part in national security, basically. Uh, 
Yeah, <laughs> that'll do. I'm sure we've got a web page on it. This is more than I have just now. Anyway, right. So, um, 22301, Business Continuity Management System Standard. Mm. That's in there somewhere. Uh, but there are more. And that's where, again, this plethora of standards can just get so confusing. Um, in my mind, the, pre the, the primary solution you should be looking for is one that's process-based, it's proactive, it aligns to both your internal and external expectations of drivers, and ideally there would be some sort of global third-party attestation scheme to assist you to demonstrate to others that at least you take it seriously and give a framework and a set of common terms and definitions that can be used in liaising with others to discuss the topic of cyber security. We do a number of supply chain audits for some of our clients and if we're going in to do a supply chain audit and they've adopted a recognised standard, it's so much easier than going into an organisation where they haven't adopted any sort of framework or common terminology. If we're going into an organisation that's adopted, say, ISO 27001, at least when we ask about security incidents, they'll know what they are as opposed to information security events. Hopefully. Um, so, uh, and this is where our marketing team must have had a slow day. So, uh, there is only one solution for that, and it happens to be ISO 27, and then mind. <laughs> hey, it works, doesn't it? It's good. Our marketing team are going to hate me if I see this online afterwards. <laughs> no, no, it's. <laughs> Shush, don't tell them. Uh, <laughs> we have got a service center email address, and I'm going to make sure whoever's monitoring it tonight is going to remove anything that refers to this slide in my commentary. But there you go, um, 27,001, yeah. Uh, so in summary, whatever standards you use, whatever framework you use, uh, general advice, certainly from me, would be recognise that cyber opportunities and risks change massively rapidly, um, both positive and negative, and, and acknowledge it and then use that. Draw on expertise and recognise standards where possible. The slight problem with standards is it takes time for them to be uh, to reach a consensus and be published. So uh, ISO 27552, the International Standard for Privacy Management, basically a specification for a management system. The work started ages ago. It's unlikely to be published till 2019. Shame it's not now. And that's why we've got something like the S10,000 and 12 filling the gap at the moment. Just as an aside, there's no accredited certification scheme for Bennett, the S10,000 and 12. There's a provision in the GDPR regs that says the supervisory authority's got to be involved in anything to do with accreditation around privacy. And that require, would require the likes of the ICO to work with the likes of UCAS to create a scheme. Um, you can imagine what that might do for timescales. Uh, so there, there are certification bodies I'm aware of offering unaccredited certifications of the S10,012. They tend to use the same similar processes, so you'd get a degree of assurance, I guess. <coughs> um, draw on those standards as best you can, integrate into business as usual. usual. Of course use risk management, uh, kind of essential. Um, plan for things to go wrong. Use a blend of controls and hopefully if you're using an ISMS that complies with 27,001 and you've got an effective risk management, not just risk assessment, risk management regime, you'll be identifying the optimum blend of controls in order to serve your organisation in delivering its objectives, both generally and of an information security nature. That's me pretty much coming to the end of my session. So please, please, please do ask questions, but not what this stands for. <laughs> but uh, please do ask questions if you've got any. I think you've been asking a couple as we go, but any? In my work, I've come across trying to encourage our customers, even though they're using 27,000. The standard itself says, and any other controls that are pertinent, yep. try and have it link across <coughs> to all these other particular standards. And I've only come across one or two that are trying, but everybody else seems to be frightened of uh, assessment. If saying, oh, no, nobody might understand that. 
So anything you can do, we can do to make the controls more than just Annex A for better. Sure. Yeah, totally. I, I, and that's one aspect of where the standards matured and the market using it hasn't matured at the same rate. Yes, exactly. And I, uh, sadly, I still see auditors that go in and expect to see an asset-based risk assessment. It, 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 it's not a requirement. And as I'm sure you're aware, any sort of audit regime, if it finds an area where it's not in conformity, it takes time for that to manage out, and it's only a sample process. The same goes for assessment activity. So, yeah. Um, Certainly, where, where I or we at IT Governance work with clients, we encourage them to consider security control sets that align with the sector they're working in and what their clients are using. Now, if their clients all use 27001 Annex A, as was or is, then so be it. But there, there are, there's means and provisions within the 27001 accredited certification framework to encourage a wider selection of standards to be adopted, especially the sector-specific standards in the ISMS family. So there are options there. But yeah, it's, I'm, I'm not quite, but almost disappointed on the rate of change of implemented ISMSs, given the uh, comparative flexibility 27001, 2013 offers compared to the 2005 version. Um, I think yeah. the real factor there is that um, given that some of this on the certification assessment side is down to the interpretation of the assessor who will naturally revert to 27001 and it falls open at Annex A controls then if you're moving as we have had you move from the 2005 to the 27001 version yeah. Yeah. you map across yeah. And you tend not to think about adding in other stuff that will just yeah. complicate matters, because yeah. otherwise it's totally. complicate matters. And then, totally. you know, why yeah. would I want to do something that will create nonconformity? Because that's the yeah. assessor's opinion. So you've and, got and that intelligence aspect to overcome as well. And, and in the scheme, in the scheme requirement, so I, there's there's a standard for um, ISO 27006 is a set of requirements for certification bodies to operate to, yeah. to be able to get accreditation. There's a requirement in 27006 that audit programs allow for and accommodate controls from outside of 20, Annex A. Mm. And you look at, if you, whoever your certification body is, you look at an audit report, it, it, there'll be an audit program somewhere that you'll get at some stage of the experience of working with a certification body. It's got all of the ma management system clauses, it's got all the Annex A and there might be a line at the bottom, which is blank, for the, the auditor to fill in, to try and reflect that yeah. they, they take account of controls yeah. outside of Annex A, but really? How often do I see that about? Um, so I've got, I've got a question uh, great. online here from Stephen Smith. Um, so you'll have to excuse me because I'm going to have to scroll down because I can't fit it all on my screen and I can't. Blimey, I'll it. take notes. Hang on. <laughs> exactly. Um, presumably, BS seven seven nine nine is a guidance document rather than um, requirements. Yes. So choose to conduct your own risk assess conduct your risk assessments using your own methodology. Yep. Um, as long as you still satisfy ISO twenty seven thousand one. Yep. Then that's not something that a certification body could criticise you for. Indeed. Yeah. So, uh, section 612 of 27001 is information security risk assessment. 611 is risk assessment of the ISMS not achieving its objectives. They're two different things. The 611 ISMS objectives and general risks to the ISMS not delivering doesn't have to be documented. 612, you have to retain some records. And the key requirement is consistent, valid, and comparable results being driven from your information security risk assessment. Uh, Stephen's exactly correct. 7799 Part 3 is guidance. Um, but you know what? I'd like all it would be great if every auditor would read it because they'd appreciate that it's not just an asset based risk assessment, which I think Malcolm would uh, uh, hopefully second my uh, request. Steve. If there's any auditors out there, at least have a look at it. Um, I, I'm happy to keep taking questions. There's You'll get in a copy of these, so that hopefully helps. You don't have to scribble it all down, but you can get a free download, 12 questions to ask your CISO. Um, there is a gap tool, but that's not free, so sorry. Uh, <laughs> and please do stay in touch um, through social media, etc. 
And I was going to use that at one stage, but I didn't, so that's not a problem. But if you want to um, see a link to uh, infographic that we, the slide where we had the seven sins, I've tweeted that earlier this evening, and my Twitter account is that. I've been asked if that gives away my age. It might be the year I was born, but it's not my age. But it might. Okay, cool. That's great. Thank you very much for that, Steve. That's really good. So, uh, I'd now like to call on the call on Richard <laughs> okay. to propose a vote of thanks. Well, thanks very much, Steve. Um, you've actually cheered me up because. <laughs> I started looking at GDPR well over a year ago and just surfing the net trying to find out something about it. I thought, what a mix of standards. How the hell do you keep track of that? I'm glad to know you can't either. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then the second thing I got that also cheered me up was the application of the second law of politics, which is don't fix the problem, fix the blame. So it's half seven guys you can blame. It's brilliant. <laughs> But then I, again, cheered me up again because you then went into some really serious stuff that was really helpful, and it put the thing in perspective for that PS uh, three one treble one. Exactly. <laughs> that was that helped a lot. Anyway, I'd like to thank you very much for a very useful talk, very entertaining talk, and quite a frank talk as well. So thanks thank very you. much, Steve. Cheers. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay.